to have tax legislation in the home stretch here on Talking Tax with Tom Tom Yamachika of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech on a given Thursday. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you, Jay. I'm glad to be here. We've got two days left in our, is it, yeah, the, the, including today, uh, in our legislative session, and then uh, they'll go uh, sing Hawaii Aloha and they'll go home for another year. Um, and in the meantime, we have a bunch of bills affecting tax and public finance that have got transmitted, uh, that have been transmitted to the third, to the fifth floor of the Capitol, where uh, our esteemed Governor David Ige uh, can decide the fate of uh, some or all of these bills. Okay, so what you know, I mean, people have said, and I've asked a number of people, what do they think of this session? And nobody has had um, you know glorious compliments about it. Um, and there's a whole range of opinion, but most of it is not all that complimentary. Um, how, how would you classify their work this year, this session, on tax? You know, I'm, uh, I actually have a rosier outlook than maybe some people do uh, with you know, the, the, the kind and quality of bills that I got introduced. I, I was expecting something a lot worse. Uh, there were a lot of terrible bills that could have been enacted and have and would have made it you know much tougher for taxpayers um, including some administrative changes that the department itself abandoned at the last minute uh, and we have some taxpayer taxpayer favorable provisions <clears throat> some of them are going to be very consequential and we'll get into those you know, one thing is, uh, you know, I always, I'm always interested when people say, oh, that was a terrible bill, and that, that bill, you know, shouldn't have gotten in the hopper at all, and everyone knew that it was a bad bill, and yet we have legislators out there who introduce these bills and put their signature on these bills, and you're probably going to tell me, well, you know, it's a, it's a political, uh, uh, political um, phenomenon, and uh, somebody comes to them, uh, whether it's uh, a constituent or a lobbyist or who knows who, uh, and says, hey, you've got to introduce this bill, my favorite pet bill. And they do, because they feel that somehow their office obligates them to do that. But wouldn't it be a better thing if they put their judgment, their thinking cap on for a minute and say, hey, this is a terrible bill. I'm not going to introduce this. Get somebody else. Why, why, why can't we change the culture? Well, like you said, it's it's politically infeasible to tell the constituent, this is a terrible bill, you schmuck. Um, so uh, they would rather introduce it and then have it die. Oh, it wasn't my fault. You know, the, you know, the, the, the damn finance committee or the damn energy committee, uh, you know, really did a number on that bill. And I was not, wasn't had anything to do with that. You agree with me, it would be better and more efficient more honest to say to the constituent, no, I'm sorry, that doesn't meet my standard. That's not what I'm here for. Well, I think rarely you will have something like that where uh, where a legislator is is both you know sufficiently informed and and has you know enough of a moral compass to uh, to make that determination and then has the courage to tell that to their constituent. Well, too bad. We need to change that. Because they think it's a drag, at the very least, it's or worse. But at the very least, it's a drag on. Uh, it costs money to spin around with those thousands of junk bills, and it costs time, and it's distracting from the good bills. And um, I, you know, and sometimes I think we make a mistake. We we let it get through, and it passes, and it gets signed, and it's a terrible bill which should never have been introduced. So I, I really think there ought to be some critical thinking in the front end, but that's just me, Tom. Let's talk about the bills that you know you have selected for discussion today, and some of them are real corkers. Yeah, well, one of them, which is going to be you know basically felt by every man, woman, and child in the state, is the uh, is the tax rebate bill, Senate Bill five one four. We've been hearing hearing about that in the news a lot. It uh, gives. $300 per exemption. So if you've got, you know, a wife and two kids, it's a, it's a potential $1,200 bill for you. Um, or 
uh, for those households making a uh, hundred thousand or more uh, or two hundred thousand or more per couple, it's a hundred dollars per exemption. So um, this is going to be for the uh, uh, for the twenty twenty one tax year. Okay. Uh, so if you if you if you didn't think that you want to file an income tax return for twenty twenty one because well if maybe you uh, don't have any tax liability or you uh, you know you you like staying undercover that's that's probably not a good idea you you don't get your free money unless you file your tax return. Okay. Um, how much is it going to cost the government to give that rebate? I think they were saying two hundred and fifty million dollars. We could we could use two hundred and fifty million dollars, don't you think? I mean, is there is there nothing we need to do? Is there no need that we have for two hundred and fifty million dollars? Have we paid all our bills? Have we um, you know prepared for all the exigencies of living uh, in the twenty first century? Have we prepared for climate change, for example? The greatest need uh, in any, any legislator's mind is the need to get reelected. No, so, that's a good. That's a good reason, isn't it? That's a very good reason. <laughs> so uh, I think a lot of people would like to say, "Hey, well, I, the incumbent, was in the legislature, and we passed this bill, putting three hundred dollars in your pocket. Aren't you going to reelect me this time? Thank you very much." What? What description? Everybody is up for reelection. Every single body is up for, because of the reapportionment. Every every legislator, every senator is up for re-election in 20, uh, 2022. To pay off then. Maybe. But you know, let's not let's not forget. This is what our constitution requires now. Our constitution requires that if we have too much money, some of it's going to be returned to taxpayers. And then, you know, in, in later years we've enacted, oh, or you can, you know, pay down the rainy day fund, or you can uh, or you can pay down the um, uh, you know, empl uh, employer uh, unfunded liabilities. Okay, but but as it exists for a very long time, the the Constitution uh, basically had uh, the the requirement that if, and I think it was since the since, since the seventy eight con con, uh, that if we have if we have too much money, return some of it to the people. That's what the Constitution says. Yeah, no, I remember that, <clears throat> but you know, I never felt that we had too much money because. I mean, for example, the employee's retirement system is still billions behind the required state contribution. Yep. But wouldn't it be a better idea to pay our bills? Uh, I don't know. I think uh, if you ask most people, um, they they would probably say it's you know I think the best thing is some combination of hey you know give some back to me, you know pay our bills and and you know and they are paying bills. Okay, the same bill. Uh, drops three hundred million dollars into the pension program and five hundred million to the rainy day fund, as well as giving this rebate to taxpayers. They're not giving a credit um, for uh, the uh, the construction of um, solar storage facilities. That bill has been, um, you know, in the ledge for the last four or five years, and it has never gotten passed. No, that that would, that would that's, improve. Uh, solar and renewable energy in the state, but for some reason, uh, they keep on bouncing it out again. Uh, wouldn't it be better to spend it on uh, renewable energy? Well, you know, there, there are a lot of things that, you know, people argue would be better uses of the money. Okay, some people say we, we, should, be, we should be using that money to improve the social safety net. Some people would say, but we should be supporting small businesses. Some people say we should be supporting large businesses. Some people say, you know, it, the list goes on and on, and you have all these different viewpoints, and you have to reconcile them somehow. No, you have to, and that's the job of the legislature. Yep. And um, this you is know, what... we, we, we gave up the, the uh, electric vehicle tax credit four or five years ago, and um, we want, we have a really a pittance of electric vehicles in this state. Um, we need more, but we don't have any state incentive at all. Um, uh, wouldn't it be a better idea to incentivize electric vehicles? Because presumably that would that would help on making us, um, you know, energy self reliant. Well, there there are other you know <laughs> there are energy, other energy related and environmental related bills uh, as well. Some of them some of them passed, some of them died. 
uh, but this is this is what the comp this is the compromise that the latest there was an came article up in the paper recently about a house that slid down the side of the North Shore because the beach had eroded um, because of you know wave action and climate change. Uh, I might add that uh, are we really hardened against extreme weather? Are we really hardened against climate change? Are we doing anything? You don't have to answer because the answer I'll give you is no. Um, wouldn't it be better? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be better, you know, if we spent the money on that uh, out of the box, creative to deal with known uh, existential threats? You ask the same question to 99 activists and get 99 different answers. No, but that's what the legislature is there for. Um, it's to determine which of those answers is correct. But the one that seems to be not correct is giving it back in an election year. Well, that's that's what they've decided to do. So okay, uh, well, I, I might as well go on to another bill that because I, you know, there's there's no real answer here except to say it's an election year. Yeah, really. I mean, you know, you you, you can argue with me all you want, but that's not going to accomplish very much. I'm not arguing. I'm agreeing, but at a sort of a fundamental level. Uh, okay, so let's talk about. Um, uh, Let's talk about tax exempt organizations. Yeah, no, that's one of my favorites. So, tax exempt organizations do like, a lot of work that the government might itself have to do. And, and Hawaii has a fair share of tax exempt organizations, yeah, including yours and mine. Yes, and including big ones, little ones, all kinds of purposes and so forth. And okay, for the and most so part, the they're honest and, uh, and they work hard. And they, they make great contributions, in my view, to the community. And as I said, uh, they do the work that government would otherwise have to do. So here we have a bill that actually strikes out uh, at nonprofits. Let's talk about that one. Well, I mean, it, it doesn't strike out at them. It's, it, it strikes a blow for them. Uh, right now, as, as you all know, we have our general excise tax here in this state, and uh, not even nonprofits are spared from them, uh, from, from that tax. Uh, and one of the big sources of confusion that has been uh, rampant over all of these years is the, is the fact that the GE tax and the income tax define taxable income of a nonprofit differently. The, the federal code goes off of a, a concept called unrelated business taxable income. That is, if you're a nonprofit and you can engage in business activity that, that, that is not important to your exempt purpose and it, and it is you know, competing with a non uh, with a regular business, then you get taxed the same as the regular business does. Okay, so for income tax purposes, the feds do that. For income tax purposes, the state does that because we follow the federal law. But for GE tax, we do something totally different. We say that uh, for GE tax, you're taxable uh, for any activity the primary purpose of which is to raise money. It doesn't matter what you're going to do with the money, but if your activity raises money, then uh, then we're going to apply your tax. Okay, Senate Bill 3201 is a game changer because it's going to say we're going to up, uh, we're going to define uh, the taxable income for nonprofits the same way we do for income tax. Off the of the unrelated business income tax concept, so you know if you, if if you're uh, you know a Cub Scout troop and you go out and have a car wash, you raise money for that. Under current law, you got to pay GE tax on it. Under uh, under this bill, you don't. Well, okay, I I, I take your point. Uh, that's good for nonprofits. Uh, for one thing, it's consistency. The same test applies in, in case of both of those taxes. And in the other, um, I think it's a positive thing, um, you know, to not have to pay gross excise tax when it's being used, being raised for a tax exempt purpose. That all seems correct to me. So this is a, a rationalization. I mean, it's a, it's a rational bill and it rationalizes the test for unrelated business income. This is a good thing. I guess I could ask you why it wasn't done before, Tom. It costs money. <laughs> T 
So now the state is actually giving up some revenue. Oh, yeah, it is. Um, I, I don't know how much money it's going to cost. I don't think it's a big uh, revenue loser, but it, um, uh, but it's something that, you know, the tax department and the administration has held sacrosanct over, you know, the past 60, 70, 100 years that we've had, uh, had the GE tax. Um, the the uh, you know, provisions uh, that go, you know, that, that, that tax the fundraising income of nonprofit organizations go way back to, the, I think, the 1930s. So did uh, the Tax Foundation uh, support this bill? Uh, we we offered comments like we do on every bill, and uh, uh, we uh, didn't raise any objections. Let's say. Mm, okay, and so what? What? Led and neither to did the department. The, the, you know, the the amazing thing is that you know you would have expected the Department of Tax to to kind of jump up and say, "Oh my God, this bill is going to lose money hand over fist. We're opposing it." But they didn't didn't do any of that. Is, is it the right role for the Department of Taxation to be opining on whether a bill is going to increase tax revenues or decrease them? Is that part of, of the mission of the department? Yes, it is. It's part of their job. And, and legislators always, always have questions about how much is this you know, law change going to cost? How much is that law change going to cost? Because they have to balance their budget. Yeah, okay. Well, how much is this going to cost? Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't seen the revenue estimate. Um, it's not in the testimony, I don't think. Okay. All right. I, I would say, I mean, and, and it's not only because you and I are both nonprofits. I would say, as a matter of rational tax policy, this is a good bill. And it was not a good idea to have two different, different definitions in two separate kinds of taxes. Well, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's by no means assured that the bill is going to become law. Uh, we hear rumors that the uh, Department of Tax is recommending or, or may recommend a veto of the bill. Why? I don't know. Oh, uh, what but, else could uh, there be? It, it would have to be it's going to cost tax revenue. Uh, I, I think they're also concerned with some of the language in the bill uh, that, that uh, you know, that, that, it, that it may not be technically sound. That's, that's interesting. That's, you said they did not oppose it in the hearing, so not not once. Yeah. But maybe they had a change of heart somewhere. I mean, we're yeah, not maybe, in a time where we need to be all that concerned about tax revenues. We're not in a time of scarcity. We're not in a time of um, you know of lean, so to speak. Uh, we do have some money. We have enough money for this big refund, and we have enough money for. Six hundred million dollars to the, you know, Hawaiian homelands. Can you talk about that one? Sure. Um, th there are a, a couple of things going with uh, Hawaiian homelands this year. Uh, as you probably heard, there was a a recent settlement of three hundred and something million dollars uh, with beneficiaries uh, who have been on the wait list for a very very long time, and uh, you know we've got. Uh, 28,700 people on the wait list for getting Hawaiian homelands. Uh, people have, you know, scores of people have died on the wait list. So, I mean, you, 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 talk, you talk about you know, having to wait a long time at the DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles. That's nothing. That's nothing I know. It's a, there was a piece on uh, Hawaii Public Radio of a woman, I think it was in the conversation, uh, Catherine Cruz. A few days ago, when this woman was on the list for thirty years, thirty years, and uh, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if she ever she was part of the settlement, but she had no idea uh, when she was when she was going to get the settlement or her share of the settlement. That might be another thirty years. Who knows? Can you tell me why, though? Has there ever been discussed and explained why it takes thirty years um, to, to to provide a benefit that exists by statute, if not constitutional provision? Well, um, the idea, uh, you know, one of the ideas behind the Hawaiian Homes, Commission, Hawaiian Homes Commission Act is you have this land that's set aside uh, and you want to put Native Hawaiians on the land. 
Okay. Uh, and, uh, but the, but the problem is, uh, that the land as it now exists is not habitable. You have mountain ranges, you have forests, you have cliffs, uh, and you have some, you know, uh, areas that are really, really wild. So, you know, in the, in the least wild of these, you have to put in infrastructure, you have to build houses, you have to put in, you know, electricity electricity, water, um, you know, all, all the kinds of things that are essential to our, you know, daily existence. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, add a few internet there, you know, here and there. Uh, and this takes a lot of time. So they, so they've been complaining, uh, you know, over the years uh, that they can't, uh, that they've been trying like heck, uh, but they, you know, they couldn't get permits. They couldn't, um, uh, get the infrastructure in, and if you know there are delays that are out of their control, they really can't do anything about them. Okay, and then we uh, you know, kind of took a look at that, and, and we 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 kind of were worried because there was a spate in uh, the life of DHHL where they really weren't getting things done, and 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 so much so that th there's a, there's a federal block, block grant that was given to DHHL every year. And, you know, uh, in the in the 2000s, they were getting like $9 million a year, $10 million a year, $12 million a year, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but they weren't spending it, okay? So, so in 2016, when our, you know, we had our, uh, you know, lovely Trump administration, um, they just said, okay, fine. You don't want this money, we're not giving any to you. So they got cut off, zero zero money to Department of Hawaiian Homelands for this grant in, two, in 2016. Um, our, our congressional de delegation yelled and screamed, of course. That's what, that's, you know, what they, what they um, are there to do. And, and, and finally, the administration says, OK, we'll, we'll throw you a bone. We'll give you $2 million a year. And that's, and that's what happened for a number of years after that. Now. Uh, I, I, I've, I've been told that under the, under the uh, current administration, the amount's going to go up uh, to like seven million or nine million. Uh, but a, it's it's not you know at the level that it was, and b, uh, we don't know for sure if all of the non-financial problems that were preventing DHHL from doing what it needed to do have been solved. So. In our testimony on the bill, we, we said, look, you know, we got to figure out why this federal money hasn't been spent. And if there's a problem that the legislature can fix, let's fix it. Because the last thing we want to do is to throw $600 million and have it go unused. Yeah, that's an interesting point, because if Homelands was getting, what did you say, $10, 12000000 million per annum, prior to the Trump administration. And that's an interesting question about why it stopped. I mean, what political forces uh, were at play to stop it in the Trump administration? Uh, racism comes to mind. Um, but um, so now, uh, the, and, and, and it sounds to me like we still have that problem. In other words, we're not spending what we're getting. Uh, and we're not back up to the old levels of federal grants. But 600 million, what is that supposed to be for? And if they can't spend 10 or 12 million, how are they going to spend 600 million? Well, they, they are uh, in the bill. They do have some alternative means of spending the money. Like, um, you know, for, for a time they were thinking of, you know, uh, giving some Native Hawaiian beneficiaries uh, assistance with their regular mortgage. Um, if 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 they if they were to come off the wait list, um, that that doesn't solve the wait list problem at all. Well, it does if you, if you get people off of the wait list. Well, well, what I'm saying is that's not going to build houses. It's not going to build infrastructure to pay somebody's mortgage. You, you in order to get them off the wait list, you have to provide a house. Well, I mean that's that's that was the intent all along. You know, from the uh, Hawaiian's Home, Hawaiian Homes Commission Act of 1920. What a failure. 
Um, so it sounds to me like 600 million is not structured in the sense that we, we don't know. You don't know, and if you don't know, I sure, I sure don't know where it's supposed to go, how it's supposed to be managed. Uh, yeah, well, we 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 have to we have to rely on uh, DHHL to, you know, to figure out how to use this money and 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 how to use it properly. Uh, one good thing that's in the bill is I think it, uh, the the funding expires in three years, so if they don't use that six hundred million dollars in the three years, it's gone. It goes back to general fund. No, but but let's let's be optimistic and assume they will find a way to use it. They'll find a way to. You know, do the um, the land preparation and um, the infrastructure and um, and all that, and they they will let's assume that they can get get their act together and use it. That means that the legislature here spent six hundred million on that, um, three hundred and twenty eight million on the settlement of the claims of the people who've been waiting for thirty years, for a total of eight hundred plus million dollars. Do we have the money for that? It seems like an awful lot of money. And then when you add the 250 million that's supposed to go to back to every man, woman, and child, we're spending like a banshee, aren't we? Yeah, but because we have the money. This year we have the money. So it's it's not a good not a good year to raise taxes if you have the money. That's right. So that's again one on one reason why. Um, we we haven't seen as many of the you know the, the revenue raises as we've seen in the past, um, not this year anyway. I mean next year hold on to your wallets, but this year you know we seem to be safe for now. Well, have there been any any revenue raisers? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean they, they were going through the session, but I don't think any of them are still alive. Good. I, I tell you, I'm 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 really not uh, I'm not all that excited about this result. I would rather see us. Uh, plan forward and prepare the state for threats and, uh, you know, circumstances and potential um, calamitous disasters that, that are likely to happen. I mean, well, any, since, any day since we're... We, could, we could have bad weather, any day we could have a problem with the supply line. We, we, do, not have, we do not have sufficient uh, food production here. We import more than 90% of our food, if the supply line goes down, we have no plan B and no plan to have plan B, and we're not spending any money. Glenn Wakai in the movie we made recently said uh, the state budget included no more than 1% on agriculture. Oh, my goodness. So what are we doing, you know, to harden up against that? Well, I mean, these are, and uh, many other questions are going to be you know, the topic of uh, our future discussions on uh, bills that were passed by the legislature this year. I think we've kind of run out of time, so, uh, and we have a, a, a number of additional bills to discuss. Um, so maybe we continue our conversation in a couple of weeks. Okay, why don't you say one more? We have a couple of minutes to do one more. Okay. I'll let you pick what which one. Okay, we have another uh, bill giving an exemption from the general excise tax, this time for stevedoring services, uh, as well as wharfage and demurrage fees that are paid by paid to the Department of Transportation. Um, this uh, gives a break to the water transportation industry. Uh, and, and to me, it makes a lot of sense to, to help that industry out, given that pretty much all of our goods uh, have to be shipped in. You know, a few, you know, a few tons come in by plane. A few tons we make ourselves, but the, but that's not very much. Uh, almost everything that we have and consume here in the islands is brought in by ship. And um, and I've been saying for you know some time now that if we and and and, and by the way, there are federal prohibitions that say states, including us, cannot tax transportation by air. But we, 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 we persist in applying our GE tax to transportation by water. So, so not only are we on an uneven playing field, but we are really hurting ourselves by you know, shooting, us, shooting ourselves in the foot because every uh, incremental increase in the cost of transportation has to go back and get recouped in the prices of our goods and, you know, goods and services. 
So any any help we can give to our you know beleaguered transportation industry, I think, is welcome. So is this fall in that category? Um, actually, uh, for for the income that this bill talks about, uh, a lot of it is exempt already. Okay, um, stevedoring services are already exempt. Uh, Warfage and demurrage are are fees paid on behalf of the shipper, uh, and they are paid to the government. So, it really doesn't make sense to tax the the the, um, uh, uh, the vessel, you know, as opposed to the shipper, because they're really just handling the money uh, as an agent and and paying it to the uh, paying paying it to a government agency. Like well, you know, like if you asked me to sue somebody, and I uh, uh, and I went down to court and I paid a hundred dollar filing fee. Uh, you know, to to file your lawsuit, uh, the you know the GE tax doesn't tax me on the hundred because it's not my income. Mm -hmm. Well, it strikes me that if anybody gets taxed in the transportation pipeline, um, the consumer winds up paying the tax. It's passed along, right? Oh yeah. So if you make an extra tax, the consumer pays more for those goods that are shipped. If you excuse a tax, the consumer presumably, I don't know if this really works in, in real life, but presumably the consumer pays less. So this, this at least theoretically, is favors the consumer, right? Yeah, and, and I think for that reason, it's a very good thing to do. Yeah, okay. All right, that's a good bill. Well, thank you, Tom. We are now out of time, but that doesn't mean we're out of bills. <laughs> <laughs> and now, what's the what's Henry has the plenty of bills. <laughs> what's the schedule going forward on the on the veto practice? Uh, how much more will we know by the next time we meet? Uh, the, the the next important deadline in the legislative process is June twenty seventh, when the governor needs to give notice of intent to veto a bill. So, um, in uh, you know, for the next month and a half, we won't know. You know, we won't know very much. And and we can we can keep talking about the bills that were passed by the legislature, but we won't know for sure uh, what is signed into law until much later. Yeah. Okay. On the other hand, we can always uh, repeating that always speculate, right? Right. <laughs> Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, joining us to discuss you know the product of this legislature and the likelihood that. The governor will will either veto or sign a given bill. Thank you so much, Tom. I look forward to our next discussion. Thank you for having me on the show. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.